Ready. So I, I will say at the beginning, you should probably move up a little bit. This is going to be an interactive session, like basically every session I do ever is. So this session is But We've Tried Everything, How Top Techs Crack Head Scratchers. And if you couldn't tell, that was an AI-generated title. Yeah. So before we get started, the Whova app, if somehow you've made it this far and don't have it already, download the Whova app. Kyle will get mad at me if I don't say this. Uh, live voting, chat with everything. Um, you've probably seen it. A couple of people even asked me a question in the app already. You can plan your schedule and provide feedback, which is, I know we're already on day one of the conference. So let me do a quick intro. Actually, Natalie, you yep. do your intro first because there's not a slide for you because you joined last minute. I know. I've not seen these slides yet either. So it'll be, be fun. <laughs> so I'll do my intro. So <clears throat> I was an MSP for a long time before I'd made the jump into vendors. But yeah, Sean too. Can you introduce me? No. I go first. Yeah. We won't forget Sean. Uh, <laughs> like Jagger. So I was an MSP for a long time before I went into vendor space, right? So I've done everything from being a tech to CTO to security guy to GRC guy, um, you name it. And probably the thing I'm most known for is creating RMSP. Uh, so that was my cool internet claim to fame. And if I knew I would work for a vendor one day, I may or may not have done that. <laughs> Natalie? Natalie Talk. very kindly volunteered to join me up here, having not seen the slides yet, so this will be interesting. Yeah. Talk about karma, creating our MSP and then working for ConnectWise. I, like I said, if I had a time machine, I may have not done that. So me. So I actually started my career working for the MITRE Corporation, working for the gov in the government space with intelligence analysts, and I was a software developer. And at one point in time, I got the startup bug and worked for a bunch of failed startups. <laughs> what was a lot of fun. Learned a lot of really cool stuff. So I don't really come from the sysadmin background, although I've done a little bit of that, enough to be dangerous, right? Keep her away from any open root shells, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then I ended up at Perch, which is now the ConnectWise Sim, and that is how I got here and I go around and I talk to MSP clients and teach them about cybersecurity and cyber insurance and cool stuff like that. So joking about not seeing the slides aside, one of the reasons I asked Natalie to come up with me is one, because Natalie's awesome, but two, um, I come from the sysadmin background for the most part. I do do some dev work, but Natalie can give this perspective on troubleshooting from a pure debugging perspective as opposed to a simply finding sysadmin type issues. So it, it's interesting to get that perspective to some of the things that I'll be talking about later. Sean, Sean, do you want to do an intro in case anyone here doesn't know you? Do you know everyone in the channel or almost? Sean's the guy with the booze. So I don't know if you need more intro than that. Wow, but we should have bought a bigger bottle. So Sean works with, with me and Natalie. He's in charge of the ConnectWise Pitch It program. And Sean's just an awesome, awesome guy. And he comes from a long career of developing uh, channel growth and helping with uh, other vendors. Anything else you want to add to that, Sean? You good? I, I said uh, you're awesome. That's basically it. So that's the talk. Thanks for coming, everyone.
<laughs> Thank you, Sean. Oh, and I, and I I saw that. It's good. It's a good problem to have. It's going well. So, the purpose of this presentation is that at every organization, there, there's kind of what I would describe as that guy or that girl who walks into a shitty situation, and you have every confidence that they're going to figure out what's going on. Um, no matter what it is, some of them, some of you might be that guy. I like to think I am, but my, my one word of advice there is if you ever actually start believing you're that good, you're totally fucked, so don't, don't do oh. that. Right, oh. you can't, you can't. Um, but I, some of the people that I've talked to think that it's some kind of innate genius or that you just have this natural inclination to troubleshooting, and what we're here to demonstrate and talk about is that it's really that these people have a methodology behind how they approach problem solving as opposed to just um, being some kind of troubleshooting savant. And the same, Natalie, goes in the development world. I know my debugging skills are limited to print got here, um, but there's actual real debugging and troubleshooting skills in that world as well. So I have an IT superhero. It's not Kelvin, by the way, although I do like Kelvin. My IT superhero, who I would get the absolute like starstruck if I met this person, is Mark Krasinovich. Um, he may largely know him as the CTO of Azure, uh, but for people who have been around a long time, he was also the original creator of Winternals and what's now called the Sysinternal Suite, and the author of tools like ProcMod, Process Explorer, PS exec, all that good stuff. And at one point was the, you know, one of the foremost experts of Windows internals and kernel debugging and things like that. He also was famous for going to Microsoft conferences and performing my absolute favorite series of talks, the Case of the Unexplained talks. Anyone ever see those? So what Mark used to do, and this was mostly an advertisement for Process Monitor at the time, he would go and have bring up interesting cases and show how he used Process Monitor to solve them. Now, this is not a long conversation here about ProcMon, although I would love to have and do a talk on that at some point. What we're going to do is demonstrate um, the, one of the approaches that I took and that Natalie took in her world toward, to troubleshooting by showing interesting cases we found. Some of them were mine directly from experience. Some of them were things that my friends ran into. Uh, some of them just ripped right off the internet uh, just so that we could demonstrate the approach to troubleshooting. Before we get started, Natalie, anything that you want to add on how debugging in the software world might be different than the sysadmin world? Do we approach things the same or differently? Um, I think a lot of it comes from your intuition and your problem solving skills that you gain by experience, unfortunately. And we were talking earlier about how this seemed like it would be an easy workshop to hold, but actually it's a little difficult to kind of ex explain the magic. Yes. Um, there's a lot of, especially when you're a new software developer of printing, like you said, printing <laughs> got here or, you know. It works really well on like recursive algorithms too. Yeah, oh confusing. yeah, it works great on recursive <laughs> algorithms. <laughs> But um, yeah, I don't. I can't think of anything else to add. Does that right still now. work in multi-threaded apps too? When you have to deal with concurrency? Oh yeah, yeah. Multi-threaded apps, concurrency. Yeah, we got here. Yeah, not not useful at all. Mm. Not not useful at all. And you have to remember, I came from. Um, I'm a bit older than a lot of you, and I came from a time before you know GitHub existed and stuff like that. We did a lot of silly things like naming things .bk, <laughs> .bk2, .bk-nds, which are my initials. Um, but a lot of troubleshooting was done um, through the code itself, not really. Yeah. Um, we didn't have the advanced tools. Uh, we didn't have DevOps, for goodness sakes. We didn't have advanced tools for troubleshooting or figuring things out. Sometimes. We just, I worked in the government space. Sometimes we got in trouble for things like maybe crawling um, top secret sites 
you know, from internally. I mean, they yeah. knew it wasn't a threat actor, but they still didn't like it when we basically. We talked about internal threats yesterday. Maybe we'll yeah, that I mean, basically, we launched a denial of service attack without really meaning to because we didn't throttle back. Uh, maybe our code was a little too efficient in some cases. Really, we got calls more than a couple times for doing fun stuff like that. So not only do you have the technical development background, we also share the love of one particular programming language. So, oh. right, no matter how advanced PowerShell has gotten, and um, Natalie and I both still have a soft spot for Perl yeah. to this day. Yeah, that was my first real programming language, because I don't count Fortran or Ada. I'm sorry to say those count. <laughs> Fortran, Ada, any of that obsolete stuff. Okay. Um, so we're gonna go through cases. Um, we're doing this talk again tomorrow. I don't know if we'll get through all of them today. Uh, and if we run out of slides, we have more alcohol and more war stories between the two of us to last basically the rest of the conference should we need to. Oh, are we really? Oh, shit. <gasps> so Sean will be like on the floor from drinking all the alcohol. So we're, I wanna make this interactive. And so what we're gonna do is show or explain the problem that came up and together talk about how we might approach it. Um, so what I've done is break these into a series of nine rules. And by the way, the, the nomenclature for the rules came from um, a book on troubleshooting that I'll show at the end uh, that you can, down, it's like 12 bucks. Um, I didn't write it, you're not getting any royalties. Um, that has been the absolute best thing I ever did in learning how to troubleshoot, so I'll share that with you at the end. So I, I do take credit for um, finding the stories and combining them and using these field tested, but I don't, I want to make sure it's clear. I didn't invent the names of these rules myself. So let me just interject yeah, for a moment do. there. Yeah, please do. I think the best thing I ever did as a software developer, and their library has expanded so much, was actually buy a subscription to the Safari tech books, which goes. So with the animals on the cover? Yeah, with the, the animals Riley on books? the books. I don't remember which animal was Pearl though. Camel. Yeah, it was a camel, okay. Camel book, yep. yeah. But um, that was one of the best things because now they have video tutorials and all kinds of great stuff. I will never let that expire. And it's more than just books now. Back oh, yeah. then it was like you had to get the right animal book to know how to program something. Now yeah. it's videos too. Yeah. So case of the template. Where did this thing come from? I'm gonna have to stand in front of my yeah, I know. computer There's to see some of the notes. Monitors not running. So when we first got the slide deck for MSP GeekCon, there was something that came up in the template. <laughs> and it said this presentation cannot be edited because it contains one or more read-only embedded fonts. To edit this presentation, you must remove the restricted font or you can open the presentation as read-only. And so when I saw this, we just pretend I didn't know what any of this was. And, and by the way, as we're going through this, uh, um, if this is something that you just know right off the top of your head because you're an experienced tech, just uh, for the, the for the sake of the exercise, don't just like shout out the answer. Um, I started asking myself, okay, so I know PowerPoint, I've heard that it can do embedded fonts, what's that? Uh, so I have a pretty good idea of what that is. What's a restricted font? I didn't really know what that was. What makes it restricted? Anyone know? What makes font restricted? You had that problem? Yeah. So I started Googling, like, okay, what's a restricted font? I've heard of that. And I started, I saw people having the same issue. I'm like, okay. Um, still don't know what it is. I just, just heard that, okay, it's something to do with like licensing for the font. That's what I knew quickly. And then I started saying, okay, so I wonder how PowerPoint knows that. Like, you know, is there some kind of master list of restricted fonts? Is it some kind of like property? Is it, you know, what, what's the deal? Like, how does it know to throw out that error message? Right, because I was interested in fixing the real root of the issue, not just getting my slide deck to open uh, and deleting whatever embedded font. By the way, it was also a giant um, slide size, if anyone noticed that. It made it a lot of fun when I copied things from an old deck to this one. It was like four times the size of a normal PowerPoint slide. And, and so I started thinking now, what do I do now to actually fix this? And I'm pretending, okay, so if a client called me with this issue, what would I go through? What would you go through, Natalie? Chat GPT. Yeah, it's not the worst <laughs> idea, actually. 
So I found out that restricted fonts are actually an attribute of the font file. Um, it's set to, to basically mean if you're not licensed for that font, you can't embed it. So PowerPoint gives you the option to embed fonts so that you don't have to worry about it being installed on the destination computer when you open it. And this one says, hey, I require a license. Um, please don't embed, embed it. And PowerPoint respects that. And uh, there's not like a easy, quick workaround to say, don't do that or anything. So what do you actually do now? Well, so what, what I did was just kind of trash the font from the template, probably what everyone else did as well. <clears throat> Basically what I did was I, rule number one is to understand the system. Think about what it's supposed to really do. And I wanna be clear, it doesn't mean you have to go into a problem knowing how the system operates. Read the manual, read the entire KB article, don't just skim it. Don't just look for the uh, little call out box that says this is the important part. The important part is probably somewhere down in, you know, paragraph 75 on page six. <laughs> know the fundamentals, know your tools. So in this case, right, knowing your tools might be, maybe I looked at the error logs, maybe I knew what a file attribute was to be able to look it up. Maybe I started looking up, even Googling is helping to understand, understand the system. You need to understand how it's really supposed to work. And it, it, it doesn't mean walk in knowing everything. It means knowing how to understand how it's supposed to operate. What does good look like? And that's rule one. So that was an easy one, super easy one actually. Issue two, case of the offline printer. Yeah, like printers don't have enough issues to begin with. This one was showing offline. <laughs> I, by the way, so, you know, the, some of these were years ago, so some of these screenshots are like ripped off of Google Images, by the way. Um, I didn't take screenshots of the random problem I ran into 12 years ago. So HP LaserJet M1522, client calls up and says, hey, this thing is showing offline intermittently. Everyone's favorite word in troubleshooting. Intermittently, yeah. Yes. Same right? thing with code. That makes it easy. An intermittent problem. What would you do first? What would you start looking at? <laughs> See if it's plugged in. Right, did, did somebody say go office space on the printer? That might be what I <laughs> would do. Turn it off and on. Yeah, check the physical connection, that's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one, can you hit the GUI? Yes, you can hit the GUI. You've tried turning it off and on again. Thank you, Moss, still works. Anything else? That's a really good one. I wish we had bourbon left, because that, that has burned me a few times. Yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah. Reins remove the software and reinstall it. <laughs> yeah, right, get rid of all that stupid crap that came with like the installation package and just use the regular driver from Windows Update. That might be something I tried to do. Yeah. That's a good one too, flapping network port. Actually, you're on the right track. So this person noticed that it wasn't happening all the time, right? So what, it probably wasn't the physical, and maybe it was the physical layer, but it probably wasn't something like the driver or something like the queue or something like that. It, it would occasionally come online. And eventually we noticed that it would fall and drop offline when one particular person came into the office. Stray electrons. Yeah, who, who started saying IP? That's probably, you're on the right track. So one thing we started to notice, it wasn't necessarily an IP conflict, at least not, not all the time. Anyone know what the default lease time is on Windows DHCP servers? Yeah, eight days. So what happened here is somebody misconfigured the DHCP range or, mis or gave the printer a static in the DHCP range, one or the other, probably the, the latter. And, and they forgot one other step configuring Windows DHCP servers, which is, any guesses? 
God, well, that, that would help too. There's a setting that deals with this particular issue in Windows DHCP servers. Yeah, turning on the logs, right? They should have actually looked at the logs before even <laughs> doing any of this. It's conflict, conflict detection. Oh. Now, that doesn't really fix the problem. It masks the symptom in this case, but the user would still be able to print. So uh, what happened was somebody with a like laptop came in and uh, they got a DHCP lease and whenever they were in the office, the printer would go offline because it was creating an IP conflict on the network. And because it wasn't, um, you know, they didn't really look at the logs on this Windows machine, they didn't really think to, they didn't get the message of, hey, IP conflict on the network, that would show up in the system log. In other words, the key to this ended up being making it fail consistently, right? So they had to determine that this person being in the office is what caused it to fail. Make it fail consistently. And once they were able to get that, then they knew to start looking into this person's PC. What's different about it, right? That sent them down the thread of finding this IP conflict. And in this case, the person was able to find the IP conflict and then talk to, I, I think it was me or one of my coworkers about how to actually configure Windows DHCP the right way so that this didn't happen again. That would be really similar in software development is making it fail when you have like a non-consistent error, mm -hmm. usually due to something complicated <clears throat> like recursion or the way a variable is passed, be, making yeah. it consistent so you can make it consistently fail so you could find that place in the code that was causing your problem. And it usually was something like recursion. So we, when you're going through having your uh, end users test something, um, right. trying to figure out exactly what they did to get this to this state. And, and in the software yeah. world, right, it's the difficulty sometimes I would imagine is getting it into the right state. Like it's not just an input one right. variable. But it could be also the user input. That's right. a good point because maybe you didn't, uh, maybe you didn't catch an exception that was being thrown by an, an incorrect user input. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and the difficulty in software and, and in PowerShell development, for example, is that, yes, minus one crashes the software, but only if all this other stuff happened first. Right. So make it fail consistently. <clears throat> case of the Glacier PDF, actually it was a Glacier PDF converter in this case. Mm. I'm gonna show, actually this story doesn't show how old I am, the next one will. The client had this particular software, PDF Converter by Professional, it's old enough I don't have screenshots anymore. Um, it would, they opened PDF Converter, and if you're not familiar with this, it's just like one of those, make it into a Word document or PDF editor, things like that. They would open this up and it would stay on this splash screen for five minutes. We tried so many things on this. This, this is one that actually happened to my team. We tried, you know, we did all the basic stuff. What would you guys do first? Huh? Yeah, that's a good one. Reinstall, yep, we did that for sure. Auto runs would be good, yeah. Yeah. It was not an IP issue this time. Did it generate any logs? Yeah, check the event logs, that would be a good thing to do. I noticed no one said that yet. Uh, Aren't you always with, running as Without app? dating myself, that wasn't really a thing at the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Windows Mistake Edition, yeah. <laughs> You're on the right track, Natalie. Start looking at the logs. Um, this is a case where we started down, you know, we thought maybe it was a resource issue, right? These were the XP days and okay, maybe this thing needs more RAM, maybe it needs a better processor, maybe it just can't handle all this PDF work. Um, so we started going through some of that. Um, really, CPU wasn't maxed out. RAM was pretty utilized, but that was just utilized in the form of, you know, things were being cached. It wasn't necessarily things that were actively in memory, so that was all fine. In this case, we actually did 
uh, do the, the line when in doubt run procmon and found the issue. What happened was <clears throat> there was something in this particular menu causing the problem. Any guesses based on the hint here? It's not new PDF, that's just the only image I could find anywhere of the actual software at this point. It's, it's an old issue. Yes, I wish we had bourbon. Sean only hadn't drank in a while. Yeah, Sean didn't drink all of it. So the issue is, this client was an early adopter of um, quasi-cloud service. They had a site-to-site -site VPN to basically a terminal server. The recent files was looking at something that was using SMB over the VPN. And as many of you know, SMB is an extremely chatty protocol and really sucks over VPNs. Even worse, this was looking at a folder or a share that didn't exist anymore. I don't remember if the VPN was down or exactly what happened, but they were, it was, got stuck trying to access this SMB share and didn't have proper um, error handling to just time out and open anyway. Like the entire thread just locked waiting to look for the VPN or the, the share. So in this case, um, you could have done two things. One would be to fix the immediate issue by just clearing out the MRU runs from the, uh, from the registry file or the registry hive that it was in. The other thing though was to event, there was a setting in there to say, stop remembering recent files altogether to fix the more. So this is really a software solution. problem. It, yeah. That it didn't catch an error that was no, happening. Exactly. No error catching. No error handling, right? I right, wonder if there was an handling. exception that was like not yeah. caught. Oh, yeah. old. I, wonder if it even I mean, it would be because if it couldn't reach something that was on the network, there would have to be, depending on what language, it would have to be some type of network exception handling. Yes. Um, this here is the most important rule for troubleshooting. If you take nothing else from this entire yeah. thing, quit thinking and look is, is my absolute favorite rule for diagnosing weird problems. Um, and what it means is stop hypothesizing, stop thinking about what you think the issue might be, and actually get in and start looking at what the problem is. Now, in the book, it was written by a hardware developer, so you know, he's talking about attaching an oscilloscope to it and all that stuff. In our world, we don't really do that. We start looking at event logs, start looking at process monitors, start looking at log files, um, turn on additional logging if you need to really get in there and start getting an idea of what's happening. One of the, the biggest traps we fall into when trying to diagnose issues is we'll sit around the table just kind of spitballing and before you know it, we're down, we're like way down solving something that we kind of assumed the issue was without actually confirming what the problem was, right? We get so deep into problem solving mode that we haven't even confirmed that we've identified the right culprit. So get in there and actually look at what's going on. That might mean run a packet capture, although they, they, there's one thing about packet captures that bugs me a little bit, and that is w without being necessarily, I don't, I don't mean this to be insulting to anyone, but some of my coworkers who are not qualified to really analyze PCAPs just throw out this, let's run a packet capture, and all they're doing is like just spinning their wheels. Um, if you don't necessarily know what you're looking for, be careful, now still, still do it, you can learn things from that, but just be cognizant of you may not find, especially now that everything's encrypted, it's a huge hassle to get much of anything out of a PCAP anyway, unless it's a very obvious network issue. And it's the same with software. Just to quit thinking, maybe take a step back, mm -hmm. not to always assume it's recursion. Exception handling yeah. and logging are really important. You know, and paying attention to when you're spinning off threads, are you exceeding, allegedly exceeding the capability <laughs> of the hardware you're working on and doing a lot of the same things you were doing, looking yeah. at event logs, because maybe you were trying to use too, too much RAM or you didn't have the CPU power for the various threads or things you all have to pay attention to. Like we're kind of joking about the got here debugging scheme, but yeah. if, if you really, you know, especially yeah. if it's a simple app, um, that's a lot better than guessing. Yeah, it is. Or just the, you know, that final, um, catch all statement in your exception handling. Yeah. Catch anything you may have forgotten. Maybe we should use log4j to get some additional. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, different profiles, different machines. 
Um, that's a good call. Cat, a different profile would have caught this. We're blown away their profile would have caught this. Um, I don't think we had any reason to suspect that, but yeah, that, that absolutely would have fixed the issue. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, in theory it would have timed out immediately in that case. So actually, that, that's a good point though. Like, if, if we were to blow away the profile, that's one of those cases where yes, the immediate problem would have gone away, it might have come back somewhere along the line if the VPN, where the ultimate fix to this was telling it to stop remembering recent files permanently. And so, yes, we'd solve the immediate issue, but we wouldn't have actually gotten to the root of the problem that way. Kind of the same thing where you get into that, like, hey, let's just restart it mode. Like, yes, solves the problem, gets the user back to work, and there is a value in that, especially from a business operations perspective, but just be cognizant of, are we actually finding the root of this issue, or are we just kind of, making the problem go away. And sometimes that's fine, right? Sometimes you, they do just need to get back to work. Yeah. I would agree with that, right? The, the, the line that I've used with my team is fix the business problem first, right? Get them, get them up and running, and then you behind the scenes can work on finding the real root of the technical issue. That, that's what we do. We're, we're really there to enable the business to operate, and they don't care that some technical thing isn't working. They care that they can open their PDFs in this case. Okay, Natalie and I were talking about this next issue before, and it's just such a cool story that I want to share it. It's actually not even necessarily a troubleshooting technique. Anyone know this story? Yeah. How can you see anybody? I can see them. If you if stand in the middle, you're not staring into the lights. Oh, look at that. Don't go into the light. Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Let's see if I can tell this properly. Every time I, I've read this, I've been <laughs> reading the uh, text based account. Why are you picking on the kilometers? I just needed something cool to say underneath okay. the, I needed a joke to put there. Okay. Okay, so, sysadmin at University of North Carolina gets a call from his, from the department chair of the Department of Statistics that no one in the department could send miles further than a 500 mile radius. Incredulous, he thought he was going completely insane. He thought maybe the department chair was going insane until he realized it was actually the statistics department, and if nothing else, the radius was probably actually accurate. So the server is located in North Carolina, and the sysadmin tested a few destinations. Atlanta, yep, he was good. DC, he was good. Memphis, no good. Could not email anyone in Memphis. Now, the first thing he did was confirm that he wasn't going really crazy and confirmed that it, the location of the server mattered, not the physical person, because he knew someone who was in Tennessee with a, <coughs> excuse me, Tennessee with a email server in Seattle. So uh, at least that was accurate. After quite a bit of digging, he telnetted, right? Uh, SSH barely even existed at the time. I actually don't think it did. Telnetted into the mail server. The mail server back then, Natalie can make fun of me because I said exchange before, we were like 20 years away from exchange, was <laughs> SendMail 5. Yeah. And this was on SunOS. If you're not familiar with SunOS, SunOS is the precursor to what is now known as Solaris, which is also now dead, unfortunately, another yep. BSD based OS. SendMail 5 is what shipped with this version of SunOS. The system administrator had upgraded it to SendMail 8, um, just because it was more stable and more mature at the time. One of his colleagues, however, had decided to upgrade SunOS to the new version, and in doing so, downgraded SendMail to the version that shipped with it, right? He was back to SendMail 5. So you had SendMail 5 trying to comprehend and cope with a SendMail 8 config file. Um, I say SendMail like everybody knows what it is. SendMail is a notoriously difficult to configure 
Mailer daemon. Um, after that, people started using Exum more, and these days, if you're on Windows, it's kind of Exchange. Anyway, the, the details of Sundown.cf are thankfully not important to this story, and I hope to never deal with that particular config file again in my entire life. SendMail 5, at least the version that shipped with SunOS at the time, was able to kind of quasi-read the SendMail 8 config file. Um, so it would launch, it wouldn't just totally bomb out, it wouldn't crash. What it did was insert zero values for anything it didn't understand. Lazy developer. Yeah, right? It would have been better to, you know, that's a good point, right? Clean yeah. failure would have been much preferable to this. Yeah, it's an easier to troubleshoot. Right, so, so if you're doing development where if you're writing scripts, I don't know about you guys, um, when I write code, it's about 90% error checking and then doing the one thing at the very end. <laughs> right, is that, is that what you do as well? Yeah, a lot, of, that's what takes the longest. That's why it didn't happen here. Right, it's like, <laughs> check, 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 check. Okay, everything's good, now we can do whatever yeah. we were trying to then do. Then you just blame the user. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the values that it turned out, so anything that wasn't set or didn't understand became zero in the app configuration file. One of the values that became zero was the timeout for connecting to an SMTP server, the remote host. On this particular machine, that resulted in about a 0 0.3 millisecond timeout, or a three millisecond timeout. And, uh, our admin in this story opened up units, and if any of you are Linux guys, you'll be familiar with this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Converted three millilite seconds to miles and found out that that was around or a little more than 500. Now, obviously, this story is a little bit embellished, right? Not everything was fiber at the time. There were potentially router delays in there. Yeah. So, so the, yes, there are probably some technical things that were uh, glossed over th for the sake of the story. The lesson from this story, one aside from being just like the coolest troubleshooting story I've ever heard and like my favorite of the old sysadmin horror stories, um, also made me waste like half an hour reading the old BOFH stories. The more of the story or the rule that this demonstrates is the divide and conquer. Um, we do this all the time in troubleshooting. The real value came from the statistics share and actually figuring this out that it was a 500 mile thing, right? If, if someone had presented this as, I can't email some people, imagine the rabbit holes we'd be going down trying to determine what it was, right? We'd be looking at things like, was it the same mail provider? Was it the same ISP? Was it some kind of weird routing issue? I guess it, in a way there was some kind of weird routing issue, but not that kind. Modern days, this comes up in networking problems more than anything else, at least on the sysadmin side. Now that we can tell us what it comes up with on the coding side. Um, I find myself doing things like playing the how far can I ping into the network game when something is broken or something's not coming up. Can I reach the default gateway? Can I reach outside of the ISP network? Mm -hmm. Can I reach outside of the VLAN I'm in? Can I reach the other side of the building? Right, figuring out where the problem is so you can start figuring out where to troubleshoot, to division. And it can be just a simple binary search like we're talking about here. Daniel, what's that look like in the, the software world? Is it kind of the same well, thing? Actually, it reminds me here? of a, <laughs> yeah, right here. Um, reminds me of something that happened when I was working for the government. It actually was a networking issue. We had an intermittent issue and we narrowed it down and because none of us were network engineers, we were all software engineers. You just blame the network? We did blame <laughs> the network. And it turns out we were right. Whoever, I don't think there was fiber back then either. I'm not really sure. Because um, again, not a network engineer. But whatever it was, I don't know if it was fiber, or if it was a T1, or whatever the pipe was, someone had uh, just j dumped a bunch of cables. So we had hundreds and hundreds and thousands of extra feet of cable that caused a network communication error. Yikes. Yeah. Of course, they blamed our software. We blamed the network. Sorry about that. And we were right, because it is always the network, guys. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's why we gave you alcohol. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you're talking about the whole divide and conquer thing? Yeah. Oh, definitely. I think just with about anything, whether you're writing code or maybe 
Um, you're coming up with a new PowerPoint, trying to explain. Sometimes you have to divide and conquer. You have to like express your ideas against someone else to get their feedback. And sometimes errors that you're just you've become blind to become obvious. So we would divide and conquer. We would sometimes throw up our hands and say, "I just can't figure out why under these circumstances my code's not running. Could you maybe take a look?" Kind of thing. So let's let's go off script for a second and talk sure. about the the blame the network uh, tendency. There, there may have been a, they were blaming us too. It was a one-sided. <laughs> um, what do you guys think is the most common thing that gets overlooked when you start trying to prove it's not the network? Like, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone do this. Um, so you're looking at a traffic graph, say, right. man, things are good. I don't see, right? Everything's low latency. We're not overloading anything. You know, we're, we have a 100 meg circuit. This thing never gets past like 25. What's the issue there? Why is that a problem? Overlooking. Hmm? What are we overlooking? Yeah. What are you overlooking? Do you know? I'm no. sure you know. Maybe I do. Yes. Right. I'll give you a hint. It is a network problem in this case. Ours was it the is ISP a LAN problem in this who had, case. had thrown the cable down. Yep. Yeah. Um, ooh, that could be too. What, what I see all the time, and I was, that's a good direction too. That could be a different direction. What I was going for is that all the time you look at these graphs and they're five minute interval graphs. And what that doesn't catch is when your application or your server tried to send gigabit down your 100 meg pipe and it flattens out and evens on the traffic graph. You actually do have a network. Like if you start looking at your drop packet counters and you find that you're dropping packets or frames, I guess, if we're talking switches, um, you do have the bandwidth issue. You do have a saturation issue, uh, especially if you're sending, trying to send that much traffic over and your application can't handle it. So just be aware of things like that when you're measuring and when you're looking at things. Um, the flat five minute graph is of no use to you if you burst for like 30 seconds. It'll show like a little blip and not enough to actually spike the graph. <laughs> case of the clue, okay, so I just wanna point out in, in this case, it has nothing to do with loading 100 billion JS libraries, but that really, really bugs me about how big modern websites are. <laughs> and I couldn't think of any other good joke for this also. This is one that didn't happen to me, so that's why I'm looking at my notes, because this is a story someone told me. I want to make sure I get it absolutely correct. OK. Do we know the answer? How many JavaScript libraries can a web page? I, I mean, I think the answer is infinite at this point. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, totally insane. Drives me nuts. Um, okay, so I'm going to read this story as it was told to me verbatim because I will totally mess it up if I don't. User complained that her computer would slow down when using a particular website. They did all of the normal troubleshooting. They swapped out, uh, you know, restarted, checked it from other computers. Other users didn't have the same website. The user didn't have the problem on another machine. They blew away the user's profile. They took the computer and moved it to a different desk. Nothing. They ended up though replacing the computer. And the issue came back even on a totally new machine. Oh, the worst. So we're thinking, yeah. Ooh, that could be. Remember the days of all those browser toolbars? <laughs> <laughs> right? 
I remember trying to like unclick the toolbars when you were running Windows Update and hoping <laughs> that didn't come along. Nope, that wasn't it either. So under further investigation, they saw that the CPU was spiking about 90% constantly when trying to access this website. So they're thinking, okay, we replaced the computer. We fixed, ruled out all the software issues. We ruled out the browser plugins, and at this point it was probably a relatively old that story. That only spiked on that one computer if they actually Just that one machine. That website from a different computer? Yeah, everything was totally fine. Oh, wow, I'm stumped. Wow. What else is left? They replaced the computer. Replace they the replaced person. the software. Well, I, that might not be a bad idea in some cases. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. They blew away the profile. Mm, that's a good one, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what didn't they replace? So, it's a laptop, right? They replaced the Hmm? Oh. They replaced the computer, did not replace the port replicator on it. So they got a new port replicator. Still was going on. Ooh, that's a good one too. I didn't, I had a good mouse story. I thought it would be too easy for this talk, so I didn't, uh, yeah, we'll bring it up later. There is a good mouse story. Yes, layer one. It's not that though, but it is a layer one issue. Um, turns out the issue on this one was they replaced the docking station, but because they were like, they were, you know, everyone was frustrated, they just wanted to get this done. They didn't replace the power adapter that connected the docking station. It turned power. out to be a malfunctioning power adapter that put the docking station into some kind of weird low power mode that caused increased CPU on this website. Ooh. So they went back, replaced the actual Doc, the full docking station, right? Not just the device, the whole thing. Problem went away. How frustrating. I wonder if this, so this one didn't happen to me. Um, this was one I was told. I'm wondering if this was old enough that Wi-Fi wasn't really ubiquitous back then. Could be. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that when the recycle pile, we hope. Someone's box in their closet, in case you need that cable later. Yeah, yeah. Um, the rule that I was trying to demonstrate, and I totally got so engrossed in the story that I forgot to talk about the other <laughs> things they did, um, is that change one thing at a time. And what we run into in this, in the modern sense, is that we'll sometimes get an issue like this and start doing things like, let me see if it's the anti-malware software. Let me see if it's the security services on the firewall. Let me see if it's the, uh, you know, going through the SASE connection, right? A any of this stuff that we use, we might try disabling. And two things happen when you do that. One is most of the time you forget to turn it back on mm -hmm. is all the time something like, oh, maybe it's um, the EDR software. Let me turn that off for a second and forget the let me re-enable it step. Um, so make sure that's part of your processes if you do that. What happens more often is you go through something like that, change 12 things, now it's fixed and you have no idea why. Same thing in software. Right. You fix 12 things, you've made it worse. Or maybe you've commented out the section that's actually writing the new file or writing the records <laughs> to the database. <laughs> and you forget because you've changed so many things. Yeah. Or you know, you up, so going back to our JS library, you update all your third-party dependencies. Yes. One of them was the problem. You That's may never know which one. Exactly, in software. Yep. Change only one thing at a time. Just making sure we're still good on time. Case of the stuck Outlook. <laughs> so by the way, I haven't opened Outlook since like 2019. OWA for the win. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, I don't know why I started doing that. Like, basically, once Exchange, what, 2016, 2019 came around, OWA was pretty feature equivalent and has been pretty good. That's all I need. 
or I'm sorry, Office 365. I guess we don't use Isn't it Microsoft anymore. 365 now? Oh, you mean it's not called like EPOS anymore? <laughs> All right, case of the stuck outlook. And again, this one wasn't my issue exactly, so I'm gonna read some notes from it just to make sure that I tell the story properly. Outlook would suddenly and unexpectedly struggle for the whole company at random intervals. Um, it would be for a few minutes, be for a few hours, sometimes for the rest of the day. They would see something like this, you know, basically normal outlook behavior. And uh, you'll. It is on a Mac. See, I said it for you. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> Just open a terminal and pretend it's Linux. That's the way to use Macs. <laughs> Sorry, Mac fans. I forgot to buy my $500 adapter, so I can't use a Mac at the moment. I don't need an adapter anymore. I have an HDMI <laughs> port. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so how would you go about troubleshooting this? Um, and, and just assume like, it, like, yeah, okay, the user did the very basic things like you know, reinstalled Outlook or blew away the email profile. It's something that's a little more complex than that and got to your restarting desk. Restarting the computer? Yes, restarting the computer. Okay. Um, and, and let me give you a, a hint of a symptom that was reported. OWA worked, and, and this has nothing to do with my love of OWA. OWA still worked at the time, as did mobile access, it was only in Outlook that they were having the problem. This was organization-wide, or at least office location-wide. That's probably what I would start going down. I, I don't think that was the actual issue, but I, I'm sure that's what I would do first as well. No, this is an old, old story. Um, was not 365, it was on-prem. Ooh, that's a good one, yeah. Stop storing your PSTs or OSTs on network shares. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I, I, if anyone guesses this, I'll, like, I'm, if anyone guesses this, I'm buying them a bottle of bourbon. This is a really hard one. Mm. That's not far off. Always DNS. It's not the yeah. It, it's not the always DNS issue here, but it is. Um, you're on the right track. Hmm. So they would see something like this. Um, after going through some troubleshooting, the thing that they noticed was occasionally when this was reported, somebody would report their their own website going down at the same time. Now, most of us, right, we don't visit our own company website too often. We might not really notice that. Um, but just after keeping track of all this, right, because this was going on for a while, and they did the thing that most of us do with weird issues, is we start keeping a log of, okay, it happened here, here, here. Someone eventually noticed that that corresponded with times that the website was offline. Not the website is down, we don't need to see that video. Yeah. So it turned out, that after someone made this connection, they have a signature manager program. The signature manager program only exists on, so right, so you know some do it with uh, Exchange server side, some do it with Outlook side. This is one that did the client side. The signature manager program loads images from their own website into the signature manager. And so what would happen is when this site was down, the way it was down, it wasn't down hard, it would just kind of try and load forever. And so the manager program would try to insert the signature, get hung up trying to pull in all of these images and just lock up on every outgoing message. And that's why OWA was fine because they didn't have this in OWA, it was client side. Yeah. Mobile, didn't have it in mobile. Might have been Blackberries back then, I wish. The rule here is to keep an audit trail. The only way that you'll ever get to the bottom of a problem like this is to really make that connection, right? We'd be spinning our wheels, all of us, you, me, anyone else, forever trying random things before we, unless somebody had made that connection of this is down when the website is offline. And I think it's the same thing in software, oh, right? Yeah, keep an definitely. audit trail goes to logging, to monitoring. Yep, logging and monitoring when weird things happen that you can't 
you, so you think you can't re reproduce under certain conditions. So it goes into when you, are, you start getting into writing PowerShell scripts and you get into writing automation, it's important to build in the, not only the error handling, but also the logging and audit data yes, the as logging. well. I guess you could use Log4j again. Not that we're writing Java. <laughs> no, I hate Java. <laughs> I, so when, when I took CS, my degree it was in Java. It was very, very frustrating. Ugh, sorry. <laughs> hey, so we're, we're running, actually I guess we're still looking on time. This is supposed to end at 2.45, so we'll go through this last one. We're doing this again tomorrow, it will be different cases. If anyone gets this, you like I'm buying you dinner, not just bourbon. This is one of the hardest cases. <laughs> Case of the intermittent network droughts. There's too much cable. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna end up buying someone dinner if there's a network nerd in here. That's okay. <laughs> so organization had a switch one and a fiber patch panel connected to each other. Before I start, how, are there any like hardcore network engineers in here? Because you'll, you'll get this when I give the next clue. No, okay. So the issue was they would occasionally get, um, traffic was dropping, they would see error counters go up, they would see this in performance. Um, may or may not have been an ether channel at the time, I really don't remember. The, uh, Connection from the switch to the patch panel, um, the color is notable here. They had an orange cable connected to it. Anyone see the issue? <laughs> <laughs> they actually make orange OM3 cables, if you didn't know that. Huh? Yeah, that's part of it. So. OM3 is usually aqua. So you, single mode is usually yellow. In this case, it was that um, some young, and, and th this specific thing didn't happen, but someone who was new to my company did do something like very similar. He said, this is a really important connection. Let me put the orange cable here instead of the aqua just to make sure everybody knows how super important it is. No, but you're on the right track. Um, traditionally, when you see orange cable, you're thinking OM1, um, 62 and a half micron. You can, no, you can get LC, so believe, I don't know who, why they make this. You can get an LC 62 and a half micron OM3 cable, or 50 micron OM3 cable. So the person found something that fit into it, said this is super important, let me use the wrong kind of cable, and, just caused this intermittent kind of strange failure. Like it kind of worked, you could get the link light to come up, but when you started pushing heavy traffic through it, you would see weird things happening and you'd see intermittent drops and error counters go up. Here's the example if you're, you're familiar with um, what colors things are supposed to be. Usually when you see aqua or when you see orange, that's OM1 these days. Uh, you really, hopefully you're not seeing any OM1 anymore. It's an old story. OM3 is normally aqua, but they do make orange OM3 cables. Natalie, we were talking about before the color. Notice on the document it says in non-military applications. Yeah, because in military applications, you had different colors based on different classification levels, not different colors based on what the cable could do. The story here is check the plug. Yeah. The lesson here is check the plug. It seems ridiculously yeah. obvious. Sometimes it really is the cable. Sometimes it's a bad patch cable. But think about how you would go about troubleshooting this, right? If you were sitting there and someone brought this to you, you'd start checking error. You start looking at weird things like is the firmware on the switch? Is there a config issue? Uh, it would be a long time before somebody went and physically checked the cable. And when you got there, how long would it be before you looked at the cable jacket and realized uh, this is the wrong kind of cable for this application? See, I think that kind of stuff comes with experience. Yeah. Because I think someone like you or I, even though I'm only know enough about networks to be scary, would think about checking 
the plugs, the network plugs, the power plugs, all of that stuff, I think that comes with experience. With experience, you tend to try to go to the easiest fix first and not immediately make up this big story in your head about what could possibly be wrong and start with the complicated. Yeah. So I think the lesson is start with the simplest troubleshooting steps first and then graduate to more and more difficult troubleshooting steps. I would agree with that. I have a really good check the plug story that I'll tell tomorrow. Um, in case you won't be here tomorrow, I'm just gonna skip to so you can see all the rules. Um, in case anyone wants the photo way to write it down, in case you won't be at this session tomorrow, these are all nine of them. Um, and obviously you can reach out to me and I'll, I'll get you the slides info. But I won't get you the slides until tomorrow because it has the answers to tomorrow's in it. Um, and this is the book, by the way, that came up with the classification. This is well worth the read. This is going to take you like two hours to read. It's 100 pages or so. Um, and it puts this approach into words. Tomorrow, we'll talk about the rest of these rules and we'll also talk about some SRE type uh, troubleshooting tips and other methodologies behind in addition to just these nine rules. So there will be different content tomorrow. And Natalie may or may not be with me depending on uh, my flight. You want to come. What time is it tomorrow? Same time. I can do it. Okay. Oh, oh Sean, would you like to join us tomorrow? Sean will be there. <laughs> That's the, it's the only reason we can get people to show up. Yeah, Sean will be there too. We'll bring more drinks. Sean will be bringing the booze next time. <laughs> you guys can do it. I have confidence <laughs> in you. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it.